Metadata is precisely the type of information upon which the entire system of automated surveillance and data analysis depends. This dependency is important for us to understand because it reveals the inner logic behind the bulk collection of metadata from entire populations. It reveals why there has been a shift from a model in which the target is first identified and then surveillance is exercised upon the target to a model where you first get all of the information from the population to then identify the target. It reveals the reason why, in order to find the metaphorical needle in the haystack, you need to collect the entire haystack first in order to then be able to identify the target. So, how does it work? As we have seen, metadata reveals deep insights into patterns of human behavior. What automated systems of surveillance are ultimately looking for are unusual, suspicious patterns of behavior. Patterns that deviate from what is considered to be normal behavior. But to be able to differentiate between suspicious and unsuspicious patterns of behavior, we first need to create a baseline. If everybody's being monitored in order to help create the baseline that will decide between who's a non-suspect and who's a suspect. And it's valuable for the people who are collecting this information to be able to say, these are the patterns of behavior that we associate with non-suspects. So we need to gather information about all the people who are non-suspects. And we need to gather the information about the people who are suspects. We need to gather the information about everyone. This is the Gus Hunt CIA mantra. Collect everything, hold on to it forever. Um, so uh, it's a different way of thinking about how surveillance operates because it, uh, it requires all of us to, in a sense, ex if we are going to buy into this model, to accept that we're entering a world in which there's comprehensive surveillance of everybody all the time in the name of risk identification and targeting. The promise is that by collecting all the metadata from everyone, machines can discern and determine what normal or unsuspicious behavior looks like. This is based on the assumption that the average human being, and thereby the vast majority of people, does not engage in abnormal behavior. And so what computers are tasked to do is to identify individuals or groups that deviate from this behavioral norm. For instance, one of the search patterns the NSA has been looking for are situations where two individuals meet in the same location, switch off their cell phones at around the same time, and then switch them back on after a while. Such behavior is considered to be suspicious, and what the system allows operators to do is to vet, in retrospect, any instances where such behavior occurred and to identify and follow the records of these individuals. But what is considered by the NSA in this case to be suspicious behavior can only be identified and acted upon once all the data from everyone, from entire populations, has been collected in the first place. This is why in order to find the needle in the haystack, the entire haystack needs to be collected in the first place. This is why everything needs to be collected, stored, and analyzed, and why the invasion of everyone's privacy is a precondition for the system to work. But this logic that underpins automated systems of surveillance raises a number of concerns. And one central question is about the actual accuracy of the data analyzed and more generally about the capabilities of computers and algorithms to predict terrorist attacks. There's this sort of belief that computers still have this magical power. If we could just throw enough data and enough computers and enough algorithms, whatever they are, um, at, at the problem, then we'll be able to spot terrorists before they're even born and we'll be able to put in place you know, policies to defend against that. And you can't do that kind of thing. Um, Probably the most realistic argument for gathering all the data 
is that it allows you to, to look back when something happens. But when something happens, like September the 11th, for example, if you have all the data, you can say, right, this person, we know that they did it, but let's look back and see who they were talking to. Let's look back and see how often they were communicating with people. Let's see what they were saying. That's the, that's the, the dream of, of the surveillance state. The question you have to ask is whether that ability to post facto investigate something that's happened is worth the price of gathering everyone's data all the time for an entire society. And the amount of power that that puts into the hands of the people that hold that data and the amount of risk that those people are going to be able to look after the data properly and that you're going to trust those people, not the current government, but every future government and every person that might get their hands on that kind of data. But besides the question about whether the ability to retrospectively analyze something that has happened is worth the price of eliminating everyone's privacy, there is another question that tends to pop up. People often respond to this by saying, why should I care? If I haven't done anything wrong, I've got nothing to worry about. How do you respond to this? You know, the thing that I think is most interesting is that the people who say that, they don't actually believe it. And the way that you know that they don't believe it is that they all take enormous steps to ensure that they have privacy. They put locks on their bedroom and bathroom doors and use those locks. They have passwords on their social media and email accounts that they don't want anyone else to have. And the reason is, is that because as human beings, we all have something to hide. There are things that we would be, we're willing to tell our spouse or our psychiatrist or our lawyer or our physician or our best friend um, or strangers on the internet that we would be mortified if society at large knew about us. Um, everybody has things to hide. Everybody does, um, not just terrorists. And if you eliminate that ability, the ability to go places to think and reason and experiment um, without other people watching what you're doing, you destroy a huge part of what it means to be a free human being because um, a watch society is a society that's conformist. If you know that other people are watching your every move or can be monitoring what you're doing, um, the decisions that you'll make as a human being are not the byproducts of your own autonomy or agency. They're the byproducts of societal expectations of what you think human orthodoxy or societal convention require of you. And it's because the private realm is the realm where exclusively where things like creativity and dissent um, and human exploration reside. And if you get rid of that, if you eliminate that, um, you destroy a huge part of, of the value of, of being a free human being.